My name is Holly Gleason. This is our ninth virtual CEU event that we've been able to offer to our professional community. On behalf of Futures and our, and our co-sponsor, Bayside CEUs, I just wanted to thank you all for joining us this morning. With that, I'm going to introduce my colleague, John Egan, Outreach Professional. We will talk you through a virtual tour and he will introduce our speaker for today. Hello, hello everyone. My name is John Egan. I'm one of the clinical outreach professionals at Futures, and we're so honored to have you here today with us. Uh, we're very, very happy that Dr. Stanger uh, was gracious enough to uh, create this lecture series. Uh, it really aligns up with everything that Futures does in, ter in terms of the population we serve. Uh, we, you know, at Futures, we have four separate programs. Uh, we have our core program, our primary mental health program, our RENDA program, and our uh, um, and our RISE experiential program. And the reason, uh, some of the things that dis distinguish us from others is the population that actually that we cater best to. Uh, our average age is usually about 40 years old. We have a lot of working professionals, and then we do treat a lot of the elderly. Uh, some of the things that we do well for the elderly are all patients have their own private bedroom, private bathroom, and each patient, even at the core level, uh, has a customized wellness plan catered to them by a team of physical therapists. So we treat a lot of patients with walkers, wheelchairs, chronic pain. We actually, one of our specialized tracks is a, a non-opioid chronic uh, pain management track uh, that you'll see there's with the, the gym right there. So our team of physical therapists works with the, this population when uh, the body starts to break down. Uh, we like to look at the whole comprehensive picture for wellness. Uh, our second program that we treat on the second floor is our primary mental health program. We treat the whole gamut of mental health conditions with or without a substance use disorder present, uh, everything from thought disorder to mood disorder, and we actually separate those populations. Also, one of the things that um, I think distinguishes futures is that patients never co-mingle between programs. Uh, so if you are in our primary uh, substance use disorder uh, program core, uh, you would have no um, interaction with our primary mental health patients and all of those programs are separately staffed. Uh, lastly, we have our third floor where we have our ARENDA program. This is a concierge program designed to eliminate all barriers to the affluent. Uh, and, our, um, and our fourth program is our RISE experiential program, which is licensed mental health counselors that go beyond the gates. We're a 10 acre uh, luxury campus style uh, treatment center. Uh, but in the RISE program, we go beyond the gates and we have interactive experiences to invoke emotion and to process at that moment, uh, everything from rock climbing to scuba diving to snorkeling with your therapist. Uh, we, we, each program is designed separately uh, for separate populations. Uh, and with that, you know, and the program uses special curriculum and therapies. These programs are headed by skilled therapists. And with the customized care, uh, our specialized treatment programs benefit patients to make sure all the conditions that contribute most significantly to their addiction and mental health conditions are uh, taken care of. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Louise Stanger. She is an Ivy League Award winner, uh, educated social worker, popular author, internationally renowned clinician, interventionist, and speaker on an, ex an expert on mental health addiction, process disorders, and chronic pain. She gets to the heart of the matter in helping families because she's passionate about bringing hope and healing to loved ones. And if you are not aware, she actually has her third book out, Addiction in the Family, and it is number one trending on Amazon today. Uh, so if you're uh, definitely, we are we're so honored to have an expert in the field discuss the silver tsunami and uh, how to treat the elderly properly. And with that, Dr. Louise, take it away. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm talking to you from California. So for me, it is morning. And for you, I, I assume you might be on the East Coast, where it's three hours later. And, and you know, I'm going to give John a hard time because I just, I know there's a chat room, but how many of you like to be called elderly? Um, <laughs> That is a really interesting term. So I'm going to give um, futures and and um, yeah, and John a little bit of a hard term about being careful how you call what you call and how you categorize um, people um, because I guess I would actually like to be called a senior 
And the truth of the matter is I turned 75 in October. So this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Um, why is it not moving? Oh, I, uh, okay. I see. But first of all, I'm so excited to welcome to Futures. And the one thing I wanted to ask John too, is I saw you had a beautiful tennis court. But for those of us that might be growing, I hope that you also paint the lines on that tennis court and add pickleball, which is one of the fastest growing sports in the United States and really is a fun game um, for people of every age. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that. But um, I've had the pleasure to visit um, Futures and know it to be an outstanding program. And when John asked me if I would do this, I was just really honored. So I, I, you've, you heard a little bit about me. Um, you know, I think the most important things is I'm a senior. I was once a widow. I'm a current wife. I'm a mother, a grandmother, a woman, um, an adventurer, a soul cycle. And who hasn't thought that 2021 or 2020 was not a tough year? Any of you there? I know there's a chat box, so you can always feel free to write a question or chat in. Um, but how did you really come today to this presentation? Did you come with your mindful, oh my God, I have so much to do. I need the CEUs. I think I can just manage this and answer my phone and look at my email or think about my clients. Um, or did you come mindful? How many of you did a morning meditation or did a gratitude list or looked at the world? I'm just going to invite you to do some different things. But you know what? Not everybody, oh, let's see if I can get my thing to play here, has the perfect attitude. <laughs> COVID, I decided it's okay to be grouchy. So if you like, I write a lot of blogs. And one of the blogs I wrote was it's okay to be grouchy because not every day do we wake up with that perfect smile. And certainly not every day do our clients wake up. I want to get out of here, but how do I get? Oh, sorry. Hi. In short, one of the major assumptions I have when working with people is it's okay not to be okay. Because when you're going to start entering into the world of anybody, you have to be able to start where they are and you have to be able to honor what their current feeling is. And, you know, as we grow older, sometimes it's okay not to be okay. And by the way, how old is everybody in this room? Well, I told my age. I don't know if you could write in the chat box how old you are, if you're not afraid to um, and everything. But how old do you feel? I don't know if anyone's brave enough. I can, I, I can only see one person in my screen and she has a lovely um, purple uh, uh, shirt on. So I'm going to ask her to unmute and tell us how old she thinks she is. Well, well, if any of you want to write how old you think you are. So sometimes I look in the mirror and, oh, Christian Clifford raised her hand. Christian? Hi. Hi. I'm 40, but I'm having, um, I can't find the chat. So I don't know if we do have access to the chat, which is maybe why you're not seeing it. Oh, I don't know. If you don't, I can always ask you questions and you can raise your hand or something that that's beyond. Yeah, so we have reactions. I just don't think we have, at least I don't have the chat feature. Um, so maybe that's something that futures can take care of. Usually there's a chat feature on all Zoom. So I the can chat feature is definitely disabled on this one. Okay, good. It's not just me. 
Nope. <laughs> okay, so I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know that. But two other people raised their hand. Does someone want to um, unmute themselves and tell me how old they think they are? Um, Alice Marie Worthington. Well, I have to go with what my mother instructed me uh, several years ago, and that is that I can never be more than 29 because she will never be more than 39 forever. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Well, I think there is a difference, and I'm going to go forward, and thank you, and I will ask you to raise your hand because I love audience participation. I think it's a collaborative experience, but how old do you feel? So sometimes when I walk by the mirror, I'm sure I'm about 16 or 25. It's really what inside. And then I look and I go, oh, is that really the same person? So how old do your clients feel? It's really important to take a look at that um, and do that. And then what age do you consider old? Anybody? Yes, I, I Oh, go ahead. I think 85 is old. You think 85 is old. Okay. That's, that's a good age. Anybody else want to get, guess what, I, how old do you consider old? I 90. 90. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask my grandchildren, they're six, what they consider old, what might they say? 30. 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let me tell you, you know, um, you know, in terms of how people statistically have it, you know, boomers were before thought 73, but now that we know that um, 50 is the new 40 and, and, and 60 is the new 50 and 70 is the new 80, we might change it but depending on how old you are, you know, you're going to see old as different. Um, and so you really want to take a look at what does someone consider old? What do they consider? And what time do you think is the prime of your life? Millennials will say, well, you know, 30 or someone who is um, in their 20s, they, um, they think that the prime of their life might be when they're 25 and they're able to rent a car from Hertz because Hertz doesn't let you rent cars until you're 25 years old. Or um, boomers maybe think 50 or someone younger. So you, these are just questions for you to ask of folks. And for me, um, this quote is from Theodore Litz, who wrote The Person many years ago. Um, and I just really still love it. Aging is the process of growing old. You're no longer that well-oiled machine. Rather, you creak and groan a bit. How many of you creak and groan? How many of you suddenly at age 40, your eyesight changes to seven times during um, your lifetime? Irene, you raised your hand. Irene Graggan. Uh, no, sorry. I was, um, I was just raising my hand that I do creak and groan. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and I, 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 my age is 64. Uh, I'm almost 65, but I feel 20. I, I feel great. So thank goodness. I know. And so it really is so taking a look at perception and also taking a look at how people categorize themselves, you know, and even in terms of marketing a program, how do you market a program? to seniors um, and how do you categorize them? So thank you, Irene, for sharing that. So are you all ready? Are, Holly, it's really you. Are you all ready for the seniors, <laughs> for the Silver Chisani? Because let me tell you, it's coming or it's here. And you know what? Don't call it the Silver Chisani. Really, do I look like I have gray hair? If I could look beautiful with gray hair, I would definitely have gray hair. But I'm, and, and some people have the most beautiful silver white hair. I'm looking at someone right now with gorgeous hair. Mine, I, mine just doesn't do it. But, you know, be careful what you, how you label and don't call it the silver design. So this talk, I have to tell you, is get it dedicated to Dorothy Louise Swartz Silver Black Wallach Levine. Isn't she gorgeous? That was my mom. She was twice a widow. She had early tra childhood trauma. Um, she had a family history of mental 
health issues and suicide. Um, she herself did heavy drinking throughout her life um, and definitely had a substance use disorder, definitely experienced um, depression. Um, she was somewhat like Auntie Mame in the respect that she, um, she never lived in one, she moved. She didn't take vacations, she moved. And she eventually died of Parkinson's disease um, and was with all that quite a resilient woman um, in terms of uh, probably creating dresses way before Bob Mackey created for Cher. So, and this is also dedicated to Liam, Alexander and Harrison who are our youngest of our grandchildren because really what we're trying to do is create for their future. And to all the backpack wearers, because for those of you that have ever been clinicians, you know about Eric Erickson's um, stages of man. And what you need to know is in order for, you know, one of the philosophical tenets of that is in order to have basic trust in the world, somehow or other the world is okay, somehow the world is good, you need to have um, people walking around with ego integrity. And that means someone who's thought the world is, the life has been okay. It, not that it hasn't been full of speed bumps or other things, but somehow or other it's good and, 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 and really be able to translate that to others. So what do I hope to, um, uh, you know, teach what show you is demonstrate, recognize and define what we mean by aging because it's a very broad category, but substance use disorders, um, marijuana, alcohol, opioid, um, and also um, I added cocaine because cocaine suddenly is on the uptick in the senior population. In London, they've seen more admissions to hospitals with seniors um, with using cocaine, abusing cocaine. Identify mental health issues, depression, anxiety, suicide, and grief and loss. And then there are other issues. There's problematic gambling, there's financial issues, there's sex, there's scamming, um, and other physical maladies. And I know the Futures has a chronic um, pain program, which I'm really excited about because I developed a chronic pain family program a while ago. Um, but knees, hips, shoulders, heart disease, cataracts, glaucoma, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, you know, um, uh, migraines, et cetera, et cetera. But there are a lot of other, there are physical maladies which come with aging. So I'm, this is a very ambitious talk, I guess. So I probably could do two days on it. And I wanna be able to identify and describe senior scams because those of you that are working with seniors need to really be aware of um, grandparent and romance scams. Um, so what do we mean by gerontology? Um, senescence means biological aging. How do we age that way? Psychology, what does it mean to get old? And I use the example of Eric Erickson. Sociologically, what networks do we have to engage with? Um, as we grow older, do our social networks narrow and we have to find other ways of doing things? and spirituality or consistent with one's values. Well, how are we, you know, how do we find meaning in life? And in 2031 and five US residents will be 65 or older. And I used to think 2030 was really far away, but it's just nine years away. So that's a hiccup away. Um, oh, and you know what, Holly? I forgot to tell you you are actually gonna grow old. So how old are you today, Holly? I, I'm gonna pick on Holly. I'm 26. You're 26 and the world is just like, with this, you know, I was 20 when I got my master's degree, 21. And I, that quote by Theodore Litz that I read to you that I got actually learned, I actually kept that from there. And I thought you must be, you, you guys are all smoking dope or something. I'm never going to grow old and I'm never going to like at creek and I'm never going to groan a, a, a bit, but here we are. So Holly, I, I hope that you are excited about the process and embrace it all the time.
Um, we look, I'm not even going to go into this, but geriatric care services is a billion dollar business and it's a billion dollar marketing business. And of course, Florida has a lot of people that are seniors. It's a highly populated area. But you know what? How many of you have been invited to a pop party? Well, the other day, this is a true story. I was invited to a pop party when I was 72. <clears throat> I went to school in Pennsylvania, in, in Pittsburgh, and, you know, we, it was a pretty close knit, and they were having a reunion in Malibu, um, and the invitation came out. And um, I spent my life's work working in the mental health and substance use disorder field. And um, it was a BYO, bring your own booze. And the bottom was, I will supply the pot. And I thought Woodstock was a long time ago. What is going on here? What's happening? And in truth, medical marijuana. Huh? No, not just, <laughs> not just miracle, medical marijuana. Boomers are the fastest growing consumers of marijuana in the country um, for relief, relax, create, engage. And I was living at the time in the desert in Palm, in Palm, in Palm Beach, I mean, Palm Springs. And there's a place called The Leaf, which was really developed to market to um, wealthy seniors um, there. And at the same time, California was one of the first states to legalize marijuana. And I also lived in West Hollywood one time. I've lived in a lot of fun places. And this was a billboard um, really marketing MedMan to um, grandmothers. And it thought that that was pretty cool um, to, to do that. And, you know, one of the things that we see in statistics today are grandmothers and grandfathers doing doobies with their 16 year old uh, kids. Um, and it might be the memories of Woodstock, but it's not your, it's not your grandmother's um, marijuana. And so, you know, or maybe we'll just go surfing into 65. Um, when we think about it, um, Marijuana, well, when I did this slide, it's 22 states. Now it's, it's, it's more than that. Here's a picture of the leaf. It looks like a very high-end um, luxury store or an Apple store. Do any of you have these in Florida? I haven't seen that one. Yeah, well, no, I meant a very high-end looking store. Um, <clears throat> and what the, what's part of the marketing for marijuana is it's going to make everything better. Um, just like all the drugs are going to make everything better. Um, pool party. This actually comes from a very um, high-end, um, it's called Bighorn, um, where a lot of people live. But this is where you, you can go and have fun. There's also drive-through marijuana stores around here. But and if you want to take a look at um, aging.com, National Council does have the complete guide to medical marijuana for seniors. But I don't care if you bought it at a legalized store or you buy it off the streets, the THC con <clears throat> content is super high and it can cause substance induced psychosis. There are some reasons that medical marijuana can be very helpful. Cancer, glaucoma, Alzheimer's, maybe gout, et cetera. But if you have a client that says, hey, I'm smoking, you really do as part of your biopsychosocial need to have a good inventory of what that means, what they're doing, and what that actually is, what they're talking about. Um, because it is a big business. Um, <clears throat> people over the age of 50 spend approximately $95.04 a month on it. Whereas Gen X spent 89.24, millennials there, um, when, I'm sorry, I went too quickly, but in during COVID, the number of deliveries of marijuana increased tenfold. Um, so whether it's California or New York or that. So take a look at your clients, <clears throat> take a look at your own stands and understand that <clears throat> marijuana is just not your kid's drug, not your teen's drug it could be the senior that you're dealing with drug. But what happens when um, 
we grow older, um, we oftentimes we experience a lot of grief and loss. Now, you know, loss can mean the death of somebody. It can mean loss of function. You know, I no longer am that well-oiled machine. It could be watching friends um, die. It could be loss of a partner. And so any time you are doing any kind of work with seniors or this population, you really do need to be knowledgeable about grief and about loss. Does it mean I'm downsizing my home? I'm moving, I'm giving away my belongings. I am, you know, moving into another thing. Or does it mean um, in the case of um, early on dementia or Alzheimer's, I no longer can have my memory. So there's a big facet there. And for those of you that are clinicians and other people that work in the field, I invite you to really take a look at this. And then also with futures or with any other behavioral health care facility you're working with, how do they handle grief and loss? And not everybody, um, some people like one-on-one -on -one to deal with that. Some people like one person to another person. Um, you know, you can even have grief or loss over, um, gee, I just had a cataract operation. I just had hip replacement. I just had knee replacement, you know, because you're, again, you're losing something. Um, I wanted you to meet Harold. Anybody have a Harold in his practice? Um, he's 65 years old. Um, he's a successful owner entrepreneur. His son died two years ago suddenly, and his wife is alcohol and prescription drug dependent. And with Harold, he took up smoking about seven times a day, um, marijuana, and then he also was using um, prescription drugs. What was really happening with Harold, and he grew up in a family, if you looked at the ABCDs of substance use, he grew up in a family in which mental health or um, substance use disorders um, ran rampant. Um, he experienced some trauma uh, or experienced disappointment. Um, as a young man, he thought he was going to have his father's newspaper business, but instead he didn't. He um, Instead, he um, ended up sort of doing a variety of different things, but he did have resource. Um, he had three ch two children, but his son died suddenly two years ago from an overdose. But of course, they really couldn't talk about it. He had been to treatment once before and um, they thought he was fine and their hearts were broken. So when I met Harold, he had actually called me and asked me to invite his wife to change because his wife was alcohol dependent. She had chronic pain. She had a lot of prescription pills too. But what I realized was it, I couldn't just send Harold I couldn't do the intervention until Harold went and got some help himself. So sometimes when you're dealing with families, you need to take a look and you need to explore and say who really needs the help. Um, the other thing is how many of you have grandchildren or have clients that have grandchildren? Well, there's a lot of fun <laughs> to be with your grandchildren. Yeah. But, you know, you have to be very careful about edibles. I mean, I have um, grandchildren ranging in age from those that graduated college to those that are six years old. And, you know, they really like those jelly beans, right? But what happens if your jelly beans are edibles? So, or what happens if your grandson and you want <coughs> to have that special relationship, ask if you want to do a toke with them. So I want you to be, and I'm spending a lot of time on marijuana because it's, 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 it's so often not, but you want to take a look at, you know, know the health effects, know the negative side effects of um, using marijuana when you're working with your clients. So they can do a decision-making wheel, you know, and you can decide whether or not this is something that you want to help endorse or you want to just question. Um, and what the, which leads me to 
what I think is so important when you're dealing with anybody, but with seniors in particular, and as someone mentioned earlier, they thought 85 was old. There, you're absolutely correct that there are different categories in aging, you know, from the young old to the old old, um, and and all of that um, in between. But when we talk about it, a, a long uh, several years ago, I wrote a Huffington Post article, which is called, which really was called "More Than Triple Threat." And I have lots and lots of articles and blogs on my website if you want to go, and they're always replayed on Thrive Global. But when we take a look at people, you want to take a look at: Do they have any substance use disorder? What is their mental health? Anxiety, depression, bipolar chronic pain or other physical health? And then do they have any process addictions, um, which would be debting, gambling, <clears throat> sex? Because you really want to get a holistic thing. And you also want to do an ecological approach and say, what kind of social supports does anybody have? You know, when we talk about alcohol abuse among seniors, <clears throat> alcohol is still the number one leading cause of death in the United States. Yesterday, though, if you saw the New York Times, you saw that there were more deaths from overdose and COVID than any other time in the history of the country. But 11% of all hospital admissions are alcohol related. 21,000 people die every year over the age of 65 of alcohol related causes. And the rate of high risk drinking has shot 65% in the past decade. Um, and 15, 10 to 15% of seniors don't drink heavily until they're older. So have you ever gone to the grocery store? Trick question. How many of you go to the grocery store? How many of you go to CVS or Rite Aid? These are big trick questions. Well, the question is, because have you ever looked at the checkout counter when people are going through the checkout counter? Or have you ever gone to the grocery store and seen how, how, the, how liquor is um, advertised? So you can tell when you go to CVS or Rite Aid and then there's someone with a huge bottle, huge, they're huge, checking out or CVS or take a look at the stock. Um, there. I mean, obviously Postmates and everything you can get now home delivery. Um, but think about and take a look at and just, you know, let your imagination go wild. You know, what is it? And the interesting fact is when you're doing a social history, of course, is 15% of, no, of seniors do not drink heavily until they're older. And what was the precipitating factor? So it's not like they started at 12 or 13 then they went to 20 and then they gave maybe a break and then they went back. Some people start drinking just to combat loneliness and, and numbness. So what are some of the causes? An empty nest. All of a sudden everybody's gone and I'm really not relevant every well. 43% of all seniors feel lonely on a regular basis. Um, and um, and sometimes loneliness is, is related to obesity and smoking. 76 million seniors downsize. Isn't Florida, John, the home of seniors? I mean, Florida is a big, big, big thing. Um, you know, um, and they, what do I do? What do I do? How do I find meaning? People change, don't have their jobs. They don't have their identity anymore. If you've worked all your life, and suddenly, you know, people say, what will you do in retirement? Well, there are some stats that if you keep working, you might feel more vital than if you suddenly stop working, downsize, you've lost a spouse, you've lost a partner, and your thing is, so you might turn to substances to help, help combat your feelings of loneliness. Um, the risk that alcohol poses to seniors is... Physically, we have less ability to absorb alcohol and damaging dehydration falls. Falls are number one. When you're intoxicated, um, there's uh, the leading cause of injury among seniors is falls. 
There are nine times more falls. And trust me, when you fall, you don't only, you can break a hip, break a bone, um, memory and loss and impairment. And how do we, you know, obviously any good program is going to have brain games involved with it. Like how many people do crosswords? How many do words? Um, the other thing is the synergistic effect or interaction with other medications. I'm not too sure if Florida has a national bank. So if you go fill a prescription over CVS, it goes into a database that shows that Mrs. C has prescriptions in five different places because I could go from one doctor to another doctor to another doctor and I could get all kinds of different <laughs> prescriptions and I can also get them filled at different places. And so mood disorders, depression, um, and depression is not pathological, it can be normal. Because after, after a loss of um, a job, the loss of a child, um, the loss of a, a partner, you know, that can happen. When you think about signs of alcohol abuse, um, you know, what it, there's a lot of drinking alone or in secret. Hmm. I don't think anybody's going to see me and you, I have a lot of mouthwash, so I'm going to go really clean it. Um, loss of interest in hobbies, changes in personal appearance, you know, is the senior you're working with or is suddenly are they stop getting dressed or they're, they're sort of hobbling at home um, or is it tidy, untidiness around the home. Um, depression and anxiety may be common in elderly um, struggling. Um, so 21 to 60% of elderly struggle with substances. How many of you have your practices um, filled with that? And if you don't, you probably will. But I'd like you to meet Sally. So Sal, and, and every time I talk about a client, it's sort of a composite of actual clients. So Sally, maybe she's, we just moved to a, I think I just moved, I just moved, um, I live in a place called Rancho Santa Fe, and I live in a golf club community, which I just moved to in July, and there's, there is a cross generation, but there's a lot of people that are over the 60, 65 living here, and um, no, Sally did not come from here. Sally was from the South and she loved golf because there she is in her um, golf car. Um, and, but Sally also liked um, her alcohol. And um, one day she also thought she loved, she loved her granddaughter who was about four years old at the time. And Sally took her granddaughter out um, on the golf course, but Sally had quite a few drinks before that, and she had a prescription pain medication, um, and the golf cart toppled, and Sally's granddaughter ended up with a broken arm, and um, I got a phone call to help the family, and the husband was really angry. He sort of had written Sally off and said he's going to go away and do whatever he wants to do. Um, the daughter was really angry and said, I can't possibly um, allow anybody to be with her. And so the goal was to invite Sally to change. Sally, Sally was a really lovely lady who was suffering from anxiety and depression and, and didn't really know what to do with who she is. But do you have Sally's at future? Do you have Sally's in your practice? Um, and it took, and Sally really had a great big denial hat on and didn't really understand that she had a problem. She just thought she was having lunch with the ladies. Oops. Um, there it is, I'm sorry. So these are some of the facts for older adults. Um, there were 14,230 admissions age 65 or older to substance abuse programs. That's nine admissions per day for alcohol, six admissions for heroin and other opiates, okay? So, 
and the total number of ER visits or in 2018 was 105,982, and that involved illicit drugs. So this is a, a you know, this is a bargaining issue. Um, and there it's grandma and grandpa. So, you know, obviously, can I drink with you? Can I smoke with you? You know, is this okay? I'm so excited. I'm going out with my granddaughter or my grandson. Hmm, we can have a little drink or they're over for dinner. Hey, we can sip some of that good wine from that you bought today. So we have to be really, you know, actually teaching our grandchildren how not to enable their grandparents, okay? It's a whole different prevention campaign as opposed to just grandpa teaching grandpa about that because you know um, there's a special relationship I think usually between grandparents um, and grandchildren but the signs we've already talked about chronic hostility loss of interest and what are the barriers well sometimes people just say you know, well, he's been that way all her li his life. She's been that way all like Drinking is the only thing that's made dad happy. I'm not gonna really do anything. Mom is old. Mom's old. Who cares? She'll never change. Treatment will never work. You know, grandpa has nothing to do. What if he enjoys a few drinks? What if grandma enjoys a few drinks? What if she takes a toe? Only young people experience addiction. Only young people. Not my grandfather. Shame and stigma. And then there's also a misdiagnosis. It could be that people are slurring their words. They have memory loss and they say, oh, well, they have early onset dementia, but they may not. And you, you need to have a really good um, evaluation to find that out. But some people just write off people who are who are going older because they're older doesn't matter they're never going to change you know and it's a lot of work um, for some for a family to address this um, I think it's what's really important is maybe there's more women binge drinking among older women is increasing faster than in men how many of you have women in your practices and um, older adults are hospitalized as often for alcohol-related problems as heart attacks. That to me is an outstanding thing. And 17 million prescriptions for tranquilizers are prescribed for older adults. And benzodiazepines are the most commonly misused and abused prescription drug. And you know, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about grief and loss and death and dying. I had the opportunity, that would be a whole other lecture, um, um, to work in the area of sudden death or interview people who were widowed across the United States and work with the widows of widow with the New York Fire Department in 9-11. But I'm from San Diego and there was a massive um, research study done out of UCSD with Dr. Shukat and it was um, the uh, Widowhood Project. And what they found was that when someone experiences a loss, um, a spouse dies or, or, or something else happens and you go to your doctor, what's the most likely response the doctor does? Someone from the audience. Can, I can't hear you, can you unmute? Here, I'm gonna ask you to unmute your, sir, I'm gonna ask you to unmute there. Yeah, usually they prescribe a benzo. That's right, yeah. and absolutely. And you have a lot of women in your practice, am I correct? Or you mentioned you did. Uh, like 50, 50, 50 men and women, a lot of older population too. Okay. And so the most common thing is if you're, but depression or grief and loss is normal, not pathological, and you don't necessarily need a benzo because someone died. And that's another public health harm a prevention campaign that your doctors need to know uh, or your doctors need to be trained in. Um, you know, folks age 65 and above represent 13% of the population, 30% of all medications prescribed in the United States. That's that. 
Cocaine abuse, as I mentioned before, is on the rise. In London this past year, they saw a 618% increase. We Please. know that <laughs> that's outstanding. That comes from the Daily Mall. Um, and um, if you like, if you those of you that are interested in, in global news, I would invite you to prescribe to DB Resources, which is a daily publication out of London, um, which covers the latest research um, in substance abuse and mental health across the world. And it's actually um, the founder, but her name is Deidre Boyd. And Deidre is definitely in her 70s or maybe heading on to 80 right now. So it, it's an amazing, amazing research um, public, uh, publication. Um, but, you know, we also know that cocaine abuse is on the rise in other populations. And what is scary about cocaine besides cocaine in today's world? Anybody? Effects on the heart too, medically. What else? Two participants. I don't know who raised their hand, but whoever you- Overdose you potential. Huh? What is it? Oh. Overdose potential? That's right, because a lot of it's been laced with what? Uh, I don't know, maybe fentanyl? <laughs> I don't know. Correct. That's correct. So, um, Alice, you wanted to say something? Well, Alice. yeah, Alice Marie, I was, um, I had my hand raised for the other option, but I can talk about this one as well. Number one to me, in the United States, we have a different perception of age. When other countries really value uh, experience and have much more of much more respect for seniors, particularly countries like Japan or even um, other populations like Native Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we so we have that perception and going along with the perception here in the US doctors feel a tremendous amount or any of one who's qualified to prescribe uh, a tremendous amount of pressure when a client when a patient comes to them they expect to get a prescription that's just how it is now if we were to turn that around okay but right now the doctors and the patients feel that they're not doing their job unless they leave with something. So we, the, a lot of this is perception. And of course I agree totally with the um, fentanyl, with the cocaine and you know all of these areas that are now much more serious and much more risky, but um, it's not this way in other parts of the world. And we in the United States need to understand that. And only until we're ready to make a shift uh, will things change. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you're, you're, you're correct, it depends. And that's why culture is so important. Um, when you take a look and you do things and, you know, obviously a massive public health campaign or massive education for physicians and the general public, but I appreciate um, your comment. I wanted to introduce you to Joel and Norman um, because I think they're a good example of um, how, how alcohol, post-traumatic stress um, uh, can affect a relationship um, and lead to um, depression and anxiety. Um, I met... Um, Norman, who called because he was very, very worried about Joel, who was the love of his life. And um, I'm changing it all around. But Joel actually had a very successful career at one time in the entertainment industry and was a um, an assistant head or, or partial head of a studio. Um, in um, that had global reach and, um, but he did have a uh, supervisor or a boss, not a supervisor, a boss. And the boss was a woman. And um, Joel um, is, is gay 
and um, really, you know, never really had relations with women. And yet the boss made um, it, this came, had this client uh, during the time or right before the movement of, you know, it's, it's the me movement. And what happened was um, Joel was actually se sexually harassed by um, uh, his, the superior of the studio and um, caused him great anguish. His own family of origin background was that he wasn't good enough, he wasn't smart enough, and somehow or other, he um, internalized this. He never spoke up and um, took action, but he, he fell in love with a bottle. And um, he just kept uh, hiding them. They hide all around the house. And Norman, for a long time, he thought the way to solve the problem was to take Joel around the world or go on a trip or do something else until finally um, he couldn't. I mean, it does have a happy story. Joel did go to um, a behavioral health care facility and was able to work through and grieve some of his losses. But this was a very talented man who had given up an entire career um, for, um, a, as a result of feeling um, he wasn't valued. In fact, he was objectified as someone. And what do we think about ageism? Louise, uh, can I interrupt for a second? I also have a lot of gay clients, elderly, uh, retired. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, and they're uh, heavily into methamphetamine, GHB, yes. and and huffing too. Mm -hmm. so, uh, there, there's also a lot of that going around down here. Oh well, meth is good. There is a colleague of mine um, in in West Hollywood, and he has some of the best movies and everything. His name is um, Manny. Rodriguez, and it's not in competition with Futures. He runs a treatment center called La Fuente in West Hollywood, in Hollywood. And, you know, meth is very common amongst, um, and I'm so glad you pointed that out, among the LGBT gay community um, and having lived in West Hollywood. So that's really a, a great thing to point out. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> ageism. How many people uh, make fun of other people because of age? How many magazines <clears throat> celebrate growing older? Do you see any on the newsstands? Um, well, if you don't, I think you take a look. Take a look and see what's in the, there. Um, you know, when we think about the elderly, um, and I use that word because it's here right now, John, the most common health problems, shingles, depression, obesity, falls, pneumonia, falls are really number one, diabetes, osteoporosis, respiratory, heart disease, um, everything. Um, poverty is, is one that we don't think about what happens when we stop working, what happens um, you know, um, if you're involved in a scam. Like think about like, when you think about senior health concerns, think about, well, Madoff was probably one of the largest scams in the country, um, but people had their life savings. They went from having something to having nothing. Um, oral health, deteriorates, um, uh, influenza. So these are the primary health concerns we see. Um, um, I, I wanted to talk, uh, really point out falls. So when you're talking about seniors, you wanna make sure that where you live, it's, it's a safety place. Like right now I'm living in a one story home. I used to live upstairs, downstairs, and in between stairs in a three story home. But like, that's not such a great idea and I'm in great shape. So um, one in four older Americans fall every year, every 20 minutes, an older adult dies from a fall. Hmm. So those of you that have it, you might, that's another public health campaign. Um, one in five falls results in a head injury or a broken bone. Um, two times older adults have fallen twice. If you've fallen once, you get a big chance of falling again. 
Um, and so when you're doing your social history, take a look at like history of falls, history of that, what's with the gate. I mean, obviously that could be Parkinson's, that could be something else, but really, it, you know, when you're talking about an uh, older adult, a complete biopsychosocial neuropsych exam is really necessary. Um, you know, obviously you all know tips to help avoid falls, you know, um, you know, wearing the right shoes. Um, I, I can remember I was a widow and I got remarried and my husband's mother was 80 years old. True story. And um, uh, she wore high heels, big heels. And we were about ready to cut the wedding cake. And it was like four weddings and a funeral. All of a sudden there was a huge kerplunk. She fell and broke her hip. And she had lived in Cape Coral, Florida, but I was married in La Jolla, California. And <clears throat> for the next eight weeks, she got to grace herself because she broke her hip um, in, a, in a hospital in La Jolla, plus a you know, assisted living facility to help her walk again. So let's talk about chronic pain. How many of you um, are familiar with chronic pain and the difference between acute, uh, acute pain and chronic pain? Um, one in five people globally experience chronic pain. 65% um, of all Americans seek care for chronic pain or persistent pain. Opiates are still the most frequently prescribed and overprescribed. And 70% of all heroin units are started with prescription drugs. But I really want to talk to you about acute pain versus chronic pain. Acute pain is I fall, I hurt myself. Um, it is generally known, it's short, it's well characterized, there's an underlying disease. Chronic pain persists for more than two to three months. The underlying, <clears throat> the underlying thing is not really known. And if I, I want to invite you, I, I don't have time today, but if you're really interested in chronic pain, there's two, two resources. One is a video and it's called Tame the Beast by Professor Loimar, who's out of Australia, that will teach you that pain is, pain, you can't see, hear, or touch pain. Um, you can invite me back um, to give a lecture on the history of chronic pain, how chronic pain emerges, but um, you, we, we wanna be able to tame the beast. And the other thing is that you can't see, and the other resource I wanna give you is a book written by someone out of London, which is about $12 on Amazon, and it's pain is really strange because um, it is a lot in the eye of the beholder, and that I'm sure that Futures in any good behavioral health care facility uses the CDC eight recommendations for how to really address chronic pain, um, CBT being one of the most wonderful therapeutic strategies, but from Qigong to swimming, to nutrition, to music, um, in terms of how we actually deal with chronic pain. But, um, I'm going to talk about probably about a few chronic pain uh, clients, but I wanted to talk to you about Nick because Nick is someone that definitely might be a client at Futures or someone like, like that at um, Futures. He's 72 years old. He's a high power executive, um, still runs a big company. He had a car accident and he hurt his neck. And he has been popping pills, drinking alcohol. He has memory is poor. He's starting to really be irascible with his team, but his team is afraid of him. Why are they afraid of him? Because he's the payer. He's the head of the company. And oftentimes with heads of company or people that have a lot of resource, people get very, very frightened of them and get really scared about having them be intervened on. But he stopped taking his grandchildren out. He stayed in bed. 
He was very, very angry. And what was really happening is no one had really addressed his chronic pain and it correctly, correctly. And he just was given pill after pill after pill. Um, and so you have to really make sure you're dealing with someone who has that, that there's a very robust, robust kind of thing. Um, and the other person I wanted to talk about um, <clears throat> with um, chronic pain was um, Hilda. And I met Hilda and Hilda had had two knee replacements, two shoulder surgeries. Her husband was a medical professional and she, a dentist actually, and she had taken his triplicate prescriptions. And when I met her, um, she was not able to walk from one end of the room to the other. And um, we talked one day and um, sometimes change takes in between uh, the spaces. And I asked her what she liked to do when she was younger. And she said, um, I, I like, I, I really, really like um, to go canoeing. And she had daughters that were about ready to get married and one daughter, and she really wanted to go to the wedding. And so somehow or other, they all, where she was, did always did outside adventures, just like Futures does. Futures takes place, people somewhere. And today they were going to go out canoeing. And somehow or other, the um, physical rec therapist was able to take her and put her in the canoe, put her in the canoe. And somehow or other, her face lit up lit up and working with a physical therapist she um, started walking again and soon she was able to walk around the property so walk around the tennis courts if it was futures or something and she was able to use some of the strategies um, to use a lot of the strategies that uh, you know are recommended and that were implemented um, by at, at this program. So she was able to walk, to um, be with her daughters and to enjoy life again. Um, and I've seen time and time again, um, stories like that. Um, and um, so it's exciting. When we think about mental health and aging, 20% of all people age 55 or older experience some type of mental health anxiety, cognitive parable, mood disorders, depression, and bipolar. Um, and I think that in my work, I've seen depression, um, sadness be um, most predominant um, and feelings of anxiety. Um, I don't know if you have other experiences um, with that. The other sad thing is older adults have the highest suicide rate in the country. We don't really think about that. We think about you know, younger, um, they plan more carefully and usually um, use more deadly methods. And those over 85 had the highest attempt. So someone asked me, someone earlier today said, who is old? And they thought old, old was over um, 85. Um, those who have just been released from nursing homes and suddenly are all by themselves. Um, and we know today, and if you all haven't taken a course in uh, suicide, I suggest you do. But suicide is a brain disease. And um, in that moment, um, there is myopic thinking. Um, but for every, um, there's one suicide for every four attempts in the, in the older population compared to one suicide for out of 20 in any other age group. And so we wanna make sure that we've taught our staffs um, about and that they have the necessary skills to do that. But also you wanna make sure that if you are offering a service to the community, that you really offer services to those people that are survivors of suicide because it's it's really the victims that are look 
left behind that say, what could I have done? What could I have said? What could I have done? That become at risk for substance abuse, for mental health disorders themselves. And so you wanna be very cognizant of that. And um, Sam was a widower and was one of those people that um, uh, was really thinking about taking his own life because he couldn't see um, any other way to do things. Um, and it was really through interventions. And sometimes interventions aren't going to a doctor's office. They are, I, I think Future said they had an outreach team. Um, I'm kind of an old time social worker that's always um, been, always been um, out in the field, like sort of that cultural anthropologist. So I love the fact that if you're doing in-home visits or something else, because there is nothing, no more rich data than actually seeing where a person um, lives and what a person does. Any questions so far? Because I'm gonna, I wanna be able to go through a bunch of other things right now, but I don't know how this is all going for you. I hope that this is, um, if there's any questions, I can pause for a moment. And if not, I'll keep on going. Well, I'm gonna assume that there are no questions. So I'm gonna keep it going right now. Just wanna make sure. Well, we're gonna go off to, how, in, in Florida, are there a lot of uh, casinos? A lot of places, bingo halls? Anything nearby futures? Holly, is there, is, are the casinos nearby futures? Yeah, we have a few. We have a few around us. You have the Hard Rock is a big one here. Oh, okay. So one of the things, um, um, one of the things is gaming centers are the new senior centers um, and make no mistake of it. Casinos, if you go to a casino nearby, they'll supply scooters, wheelchairs, oxygen. Um, some have diabetic needles inside. I mean, maybe I've only lived where there's all the casinos, but, you know, the deserts. But what are the good things? They remember my birthday. They're going to send me a birthday card or give me a free dinner. They're also going to provide entertainment, connection, and food. I can go to the local um, casino and they're going to welcome me. They say, hi, Sally. They're even going to come pick me up from where I live. And they're gonna provide distraction from what ails me. They also allow for excitement and sense of belonging. And just the way, um, just the way, um, just the way digital, you know, these little phones, the digital addiction takes over with some of it. So can the ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching of a slot machine or something else. But this provides an opportunity for someone to go somewhere. So how many people that you work with like to go to the casinos or like, to, like that sort of thrill and excitement? It is a way of connection and a way of belonging. So how can we get that to work a little better? You know, um, risks and signs or seniors cannot make up their losses. You know, the income is not infinite unless there's a law. M dopamine antagonists, medications, um, like for Parkinson's, if you're in a casino, can put some, somebody at a higher risk. There could be early signs of dementia or Alzheimer's, but there's this lot of depression, shame, and anxiety, which comes from gambling. And now you don't really even have to leave your home to gamble. You might gamble at the horse races. You might gamble somewhere else. You might invest in stocks. You might invest in Bitcoin. But there's but going to a place, um, you know, you have to learn how to manage or help someone manage their risk or take a look at the app. And again, as part of a social history, how do they spend their time? How do they spend their money? Do they like going here and there? 
you know, some way you can tell a loved one's just suddenly asking for loans. Are there more doctor visits? Um, um, is there less food in the refrigerator? Sometimes if you're busy going out, there's past due to utilities and there's poor decision-making skills. You can lose a lot of money at um, the casinos um, and, you know, and putting your whole life savings at risk for something. I, I want you to meet Dr. R because Dr. R was this beautiful, beautiful woman. She was a trained medical doctor, um, grew up in India. Um, she um, had a divorce. Um, she had a daughter that was actually going to be going into counseling. And the daughter called me because Dr. R suddenly had no money. Her life savings was dissipated and her life savings was dissipated because she spent so much time at the casinos. She just lost all her money. On doing a complete neuropsych eval, it was determined that she was on a stage of early onset um, dementia and her faculty. So that's why it's such a good, you know, so important. But she had been taken up. The, ma the marriage dissolvement was very hard on her. Leaving the hospital, which she loved to work at, was very hard on her. And she found solace, connection. They said, welcome, Dr. R. I'm so glad that you're here. They were trained to really welcome her. And so, you know, it was the, the thing what was so helpful for Dr. R was, you know, taking a look at her, getting her a good physical, helping her family understand that she's not a bad person. She has a disease and helping her thrive for however she was able to thrive. And I think that's the most important thing. Um, and I want to talk, has anybody ever had a client that's been scammed? scam. Um, a year ago during COVID, I was invited to sit on a national board and I felt really honored. It was put together by the AARP and um, Piner Research Institute and they gathered um, top minds in the country. I was one of the few clinicians that was taking a look at what are the characteristics and what is the impulsivity of people that are being scammed and took a look at some of the scams that target the elderly. And I thought this was really, really important because you know one of the things you wanna take a look at is how are people, and you might get phone calls like this. So there's all kinds of scams. The top 10 are, you, someone calls you up in person, it's your social security, you need your number, et cetera. You know, how many of you have your, your if you can help your seniors undo the robocalls or the unsolicited phone calls. Um, there's sweepstakes scams, I just want a sweepstake. Romance scams I want to talk about. Computer tech support scams. I mean, how many people, you know, there's something wrong with your computer and you need to re-up this. Um, and the grandparent scam I also want to talk about. There's the IRS impersonation scam. There's identity, debt. And of course, there's elder financial abuse, which could come from a family member or something else. But the average loss in scams targeted seniors is each is 16,700. Do you know anybody? Have you ever been scammed? If you have, you're not alone. That's all I want to, want to say to you. Um, um, scams are costing about $36.5 billion a year. Um, and they use misleading tricks to, to seniors to, to trick them into financial mistakes, fraud, con conning seniors into sending money or sharing personal information, trust, taking advantage of a trusting relationship to scam money from seniors or others, $6.7 billion. Um, the top senior scams are grandparent scam. Has anybody client ever received a phone call? They're so convincing because you, you love your grandchildren and they'll call up and they'll say, Skylar's in trouble. 
he's just been arrested for doing something or other. And I represent A, B, C, D, and U police department. And you need to um, bail him out. He doesn't want to um, let his father or mother know. He only wants to talk to you. And then suddenly you're talking on the phone with someone now you really believe is your grandson. And you're talking to him. And the next moment, the people are saying, well, we can avoid him getting into trouble, but you need to go to Best Buy. Best Buy. And buy X number of thousand dollars of, of cards and send it um, to us and we'll get him released from bail. And before you know it, because you haven't thought, who in the world, what police department or lawyer takes Best Buy cards? They're non-traceable. They're not anything. Um, and the next thing you know, you have now spent ten thousand dollars because you ran out, and um, it's not. It, it's and you don't want, and you agree not to tell, find out if he's really okay or not. You know, but um, you know, and I'll talk more about romance scams also. But you know, you know, um, there, there's this insistence to keep it a secret. Don't tell anybody. And there might be misspellings or poor grammar or anything. And, and you know, if those of you that are dealing with seniors, that, that people are very vulnerable, um, especially when you're lonely or you have an impulsivity in a nature or even a history of substance abuse in your family. It, it's sort of that uh, they, they found there was that impulsivity. Um, there's online dating scams. Um, Recently, I got a phone call from someone whose mother had spent $500,000, $500,000. I wish I had $500,000 just and sent it over to, a, and had also traveled to Dubai. Um, but there was no one there to give someone money because they were having a love affair with them by phone. But every, and, and also I've dealt with gentlemen who have an online love interest and they ask for money. But they, and they always are coming over, but they never can pay, make it to the United States. Um, have, do any of you work with clients that have been had online scams? I see someone shaking their head. Yes, you do. Um, um, and so that, that becomes really um, a, uh, a really, really, really tragic because there's, there's so much money at stake and families are really angry. Um, uh, trust attorneys are really angry, um, but yet one has to really be able to, able to stop sort of the fantasy and gently allow this person to still save face. Um, another scam, which is really popular, and um, it's hard to tell, and that is when probably the worst scam in the world is when you have someone who you're close to, and this is usually what happens, and they ask you to invest money with them. And because they're close to you, you know them, you think that's a good idea. And again, the classic, there are two classic ones. One was the Madoff scam where um, Madoff had millions of people invest with him. Uh, a lot of people lost their money. Another one was Equitas, which just settled. And Equitas was uh, Corinthian loans. And uh, a lot of people had financial planners that they thought were the best friends and they knew that it was going under and um, still took their money. And so when it's a scam where you know someone or know a family friend, um, there's a great deal of pain and embarrassment. Like, how did I not bet, know better? Online dating scams are usually, parents are very secretive. They won't tell their, their children that they're doing this. Um, it's as secretive as using alcohol or other drugs, but you know, it, it is something that I think as clinicians, we need to be really mindful of. Um, and the sweetheart scam, you've recently retired, um, you know, you don't know um, what's going on 
um, there. And this is the way that, God, there's someone willing to talk to me. Again, there's someone willing connection. So when you think about a lot of times in recovery, we use uh, companions, right? Or accountability coaches. I can't think of anything better to use with seniors, um, but having someone join up with them and having someone be um, with them so they can learn. Because I, I will tell you on the outside, if you're doing treatment without walls, the person that will learn the most about the senior is the accountability coach or the mentor um, that, that if the family will put in. And inside the treatment center, figuring out what kind of scaffolding someone needs when they leave treatment. So these are signs of a scan, you know, claims to need money, emergency, plans to visit, they never can visit. They, um, and I've talked about the grandparent scam, which is just humiliating, shame, and embarrassed. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell. Like suddenly you've just gone off, you, you ran to Best Buy. You didn't think it through, you know? Brilliant people, straight people, but because their hearts are so touched um, and everything. Um, and, I, you know, these kinds of, if you have posters or anything, or you have handouts, you know, it's also good if you're working with um, the children of, 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 of seniors, um, the adults. So they understand what can, um, you know, what's going on, what's happening. Um, so how, how do you help avoid a senior? You check in off and see how your loved one's doing. And then, again, I love the idea of an accountability coach. I love the idea. There's a lot of people that love to do service that are also trained in mental health. There are also retired military who might work for that. Um, you know, educating your loved one about their risk for fraud, um, making sure that their money is secure, um, you know, making sure that there's an antivirus software installed and up to date on the computer, making sure on the telephone, you know, when we get phone calls, how many of us get so many that are blocked, you know, and, and how many phone robocalls do you get a day? Do you guys get any robocalls? you know, um, and registering a senior with the do not call registry to cut out their chances of being targeted by scammers is really important. Um, uh, and so I think there's a lot of things we can do when we um, are able to um, build scaffolding for things. And, you know, I think every day, I think just now, I just got a scam. I got a phone thing. I love it. I was looking here at my phone because I was telling you about phones. And so if you don't think it, it's like contact, card locked. My cards are not locked. My credit card's not locked. But if I call this, I bet they'll ask me, tell me about your credit card. Tell me about that. So I'm always, um, you know, taking a look at, um, at, at what's going on. So I, I, I only tell you things because I know that they happen to all of us. So take a look at yours as well. Um, I think it's really important and I'm so delightful that there are centers that focus on geriatric and aging issues. Although I do believe in cross-generational, um, which means that I like behavioral health care centers that also incorporate different ages. Um, because I think we can learn from different ages that it doesn't have to be totally age segregated. Um, because a senior can be a mentor to someone younger. Someone younger can be a mentor to someone older. Um, and unless you know, you're in a place where you really need the extended care, then I think you have to staff it. You know, and I'm often thought of, I, I mean, I think I should have rededicated 
this um, talk to my mentor. Um, when I was 20, I actually got my first degree, my master's degree um, in social work. And my, and my professor, his name was Glenn, his name is Glenn Hayworth. And um, I, he was so brilliant, I never understood what he was saying. He would chortle. And, um, and you know, he, uh, he, he always was very existential. Well, today, Dr. Hayworth is 96 years old. And um, he's still one of the smartest gentlemen I know. It's hard to believe that I have known him for this many years. Um, and he currently is living in a senior um, center, um, but it's good because it has different levels of care because he's going blind. His, his eyesight is going. And yet what gives him richness and being is at the center is the staff. There's someone who does philosophical discussions. But I went to visit him almost, I don't know, I always go to visit him at least once a month. Um, I can now live closer to him. And I was telling him that I was going to be giving um, uh, this talk. And he, re and he reminded me, yes, he is old, old. Yes, he, he, he is, he, you know, he's in a place where he says, only people leave, they don't really come. And when they leave, they leave in ambulances. Um, he is very existential in his being. And yet he has such a resiliency that I still have the ability to learn from him. So I, I guess my message is that he reminds me how much we can learn from those that, are, that have lived life to the fullest. Um, sex, sex is not dead when you age, okay? I don't know how it did that. The other day, <laughs> I was, I must be doing all these things in preparation for our talk. So I moved back to San Diego and I've had four live births. I had four children. My third child died of sudden infant death syndrome. But I moved back to San Diego and I said, oh my gosh, I need to go see a gynecologist. Oh my goodness. Yes, people older still see gynecologists. And um, I went and, and one of them that had delivered my fourth child. So he was a good 15, 16 years, was still in practice. So I went to visit him and he said, you know, you're probably the oldest living person I have in um in, in the practice. And he pulled out a little black book, which before computers, this, this practice used to keep track of people when they're, when they're having babies and the due date. And I saw all four of my children in this little tiny black book. But we talked about sex and aging, you know, because sometimes people think that once you're of a certain age, that that's not really important or that's not there. But um, certainly that is important. And I remember going to Ocala, Florida in a senior center that had the highest rate of STDs of anywhere in the country. And that's because nobody taught anybody <laughs> about, um, you know, sort of safe sex. So, you know, that's a conversation that is a fun one to have with with whoever you're working with and um, know that it's okay and maybe you can learn a tip or uh, 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 you can have a tip or two but don't be afraid to talk about it and don't consider just because someone's older that they have no fantasies that they don't think about it or whatever they do um, you know what i really want all of you to do is take the lead get active get inspired and get involved. Become the leaders in your community. And not just as an individual practitioner, but be a voice. Um, because I, I'm picking on Holly because I can see her in the thing. What Holly doesn't know is she actually is going to one day be my age or your age. And what kind of world 
does she want to create? And the beauty is that she has an opportunity. Or John, who we met earlier, he too is going to grow. And, and while people think it's really important to create centers or behavioral health care for seniors, what kind of care do you want? What do you envision? You know, when you think about successful components, um, you think about finances, activities, preventive health, spirituality or being consistent, self-worth, you know, um, how do you want to live? Where do you want to live? Where can we live? Do we want to live in age segregated housing? Um, do we want to live in different levels of care? Um, and or how do we incorporate cross-generational into that? Um, you know, when we think about successful aging, we talk about um, minimizing risks of disease and disability, continue engagement with life, maintain positive spirituality, maintain physical and cognitive functioning. So, I mean, that's what we mean by successful aging. Um, keep doing that wrong. You know, what kind of evidence-based strategies do we use? Um, everything from, and those are all acronyms, ACT, MI, SFT, CBT, exercise, mindfulness, nutrition. You know, we optimize physical and cognitive mental health, um, facilitating social engagement. Chronic pain has nine different things. Um, you want to build on strengths. And you, I have a strength-based perspective. So I want you always to look for goodness. Um, look for resiliency. Take a look and, and see all the things people have done, you know, how they've transformed. Um, and make sure that your staff is intergenerational. Um, acknowledge accomplishments, enjoyment, financial, physical appearance, productivity, you know. Um, and again, I guess it's really a multi modal approach. I think I'm going to he head on to ending because I know that there are questions that people are going to have, but I want to end. Um, this is my first book I wrote, um, which is now, um, and it was a memoir. So if you want a memoir to read, just be sure and get it. It's called Falling Up. But I want to uh, invite you to allow yourself for a time for laughter, a time for tears, a time for joy, for creativity, for forgiveness, for moving on, for starting over, for making amends to yourself, to others that you love, for coloring outside the lines, for staying curious, for making a difference, because all of you on the Zoom call I know are making a difference for communicating with the cosmos, for spirituality, for curiosity, for imagination, and for bravery, and for keep falling up. So be visible, vocal, and visionary. So I'm gonna stop and see what questions you have or comments and you know I just wanna thank you. I, I always wish that I could be in person because I think sometimes it's just so hard to be on a Zoom. And I can see your beautiful faces like Hollywood squares. <laughs> so any concerns, questions, tell me what you do and how you, how you are addressing this population because we can learn from you. The gentleman with the white hat cap, I see you. I don't know what your name is. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, my name is Jamie Guerin. Um, I work, I'm here down here in South Florida. Uh, I have a lot of elderly uh, uh, gay population, plus all sorts of straight people. Um, but a lot of the stuff that uh, you talked about definitely resonates. Um, a lot of them, uh, I, one of the things I'd like to ask, I don't know if, if you can talk about that when we, I know you talked about grief and loss, but when you lose a partner, especially in the gay population, because they don't have a lot of family, you know, when, when you're a, a grandparent and you have kids, you have somebody, especially with the holidays coming up, 
you know, and you get, you get older, you lose your friends. Um, so I don't know if that's something that you can address or anybody else wants to talk about. Well, I think that's a great question. And that is whether it's inside the gay community or somewhere else, a lot of times you don't have family. And last year in COVID, nobody had family per se, because just think about the isolation. But I think that if there is, um, and I don't know where you are, I know when I lived in West Hollywood, which is actually obviously a very gay friendly community and obviously had a lot of outreach workers, um, and obviously had a lot of ways of bringing people in. Sometimes in my experience working with death and sudden death, sometimes it's just one person reaching out to another. It's not that they need to go to a group, but I think you're absolutely you know, correct. Um, if there is no family, there is no children, but did they build a social network of friends? And if all their friends are gone, then how do we reconnect them with someone else? Great question. Anybody else? Want one to one of the things I did was I had a common thread among many of my clients, and they all mentioned the word dread within a session. So I started a group, I, I comically or kind of uh, uh, in fun called it the dread group. And it was an opportunity for, uh, you know, older men to meet other men and then they could go out and socialize if they wanted to or check up on each other. There was one guy actually, he would drove, he drove his friend or his new friend to his doctor appointments, you know, because how do you get to someplace if you're sick, um, you want somebody around to help you out, you know? So it was, it was a great experience. It lasted about two years and people kind of dropped off. So I've stopped the group. So, but I think that, you know, you can check with centers or somewhere else, even people, you know, so I think that that's great that you did the group, but um, I, I think also if there's any kind of center around, you can, you can do work with them as well. I mean, there's a lot of that is pro bono. Anybody else? Um, the gentleman, I don't know with the, he's right below you on my screen, but I don't know his name um, or... Um, anyone else have anything they would like to share or ask questions? Dr. Steger, hi, it's Johnny. Um, one thing, and maybe you can comment a little bit more, um, but sometimes when we have these, these mental health conditions such as depression, but they get disregarded um, for seniors such as frailty or chronic illness, even the disability, how to properly navigate a, you know, a severe mental condition happening, whereas maybe it's just being disregarded because of a certain stage of life change. Well, I think that what I talked about before, John was you know, taking a look and saying, oh, there's nothing we can do because the, I, when you say stage of life change, can you clarify what you mean? So I understand correctly your question. Yeah, just so when, um, as, as we get older, our bodies, um, you know, maybe they're not as <clears throat> the musculature or what have you. So maybe there's disabilities that start to happen, but I'm talking more about the mental health that the deterioration or the uh, prevalence of a, of a mental health condition that might get disregarded or thought of, oh, that's just them getting older. They're, they're supposed to be like that now, as opposed to an actual major condition happening. Well, I think that's the part of, 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 of taking a look at who the providers are and also a family, because as I told you about, um, you know, a lot of times people want to write someone off. I mean, I get a lot of phone calls and sometimes I'll say, well, we can't do anything about them. They're just too old. We can't help like a lot of, I mean, I remember a woman who was in her forties calling me about her mother who had, was alcohol dependent. And, you know, she did call me because she was curious, but then she said, well, I really can't do anything. You know, she's just too old. She won't change. I don't want to spend the money. I don't want to do anything. And so it's a matter of educating, um, I think, in the beginning um, and uh, people and to know that there's always change and there's always hope and there's always the possibility for people to grow. And just because you're a certain chronological age does it mean that you don't deserve to have that explored? 
that that requires a lot of psychoeducation with whoever the first caller is, because Johnny, whoever that first caller is, is not that person. It's someone calling to complain or be frightened about their loved one. What are your practices like? I see that you're all here and, 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 and what wisdom would you like to add to this discussion? Oh, I know there's a bunch of brilliant people in this room. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Hi, Louise. This is Carla. How are you? Fine. Hi, Carla. Hi. I am actually just to add, and first of all, thank you for your presentation, but in adding that it's almost as if we need to make a cultural change in terms of how we see seniors. You know, I know we spoke of that earlier. Culturally, it's different in, in, other, um, in other countries and so forth, continents. But here, it's it's just uh, it's depressing how we do see you know how we treat our seniors. So in a sense, it's I'm just I'm all for looking for ways that we can um, just change the mindset of the masses when it comes to uh, caring for our loved ones and seniors. Well, I think it starts with you. I mean, when yep. I say visible, vocal visionary is who wants to start a magazine celebrating seniors and, and mm. make sure that it gets on Hudson News in every, in every um, airport in the country. That's who beautiful. wants to talk about resiliency? Who wants to not just give everybody a pretty picture? Who wants to teach others about chronic pain or even the scams, which are the scams are really prevalent. I don't know how to tell you, and everybody is very vulnerable for those because of loneliness. Um, you know, it it it's not as um, sometimes people think it's really sexy to talk about failure to launch and you know children because they're our future. But um, you know, when you think about the population, it's 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 incredibly large. Thomas, you raised your hand. Oh, someone named Thomas wants to. Yeah, speak. thank you. It's really Tom, but I don't know how to change it on there. But thank you. Oh, okay, that's okay. <laughs> thank you, Louise. Great talk. I mean, the the title of the seminar is what got my attention on the email, and just uh, I've been practicing thirty six years and. Uh, I just turned 60 this year. So as I kind of have worked in behavioral health and specifically drug and alcohol, I just have, mm -hmm. as I've gotten older, I've dealt with the population. <laughs> so now I'm in my senior years and, uh, you know, my practice is, uh, so I do two things. I have a private practice and then uh, I'm with a company called Ethos. And what I do at Ethos, and it was a bit of a pet project the last two years was I do the primary alcohol group, which tends to be people 40 on up and a lot of people in their 50s and 60s. And it's interesting when you said about falling, uh, I just put somebody in um, treatment and she was 75 and she fell down the steps and cracked her eye socket. And uh, that was actually the issue that finally got her into residential rehab so I'm so glad you covered that and also the uh, you know what James said too about grief and loss because um, it's amazing you know the the older that a lot of my clients get the more they kind of their friends are passing away and their or a family members passing away and they just and, and you're absolutely right they just go to their primary care physicians who a lot of them are older folks too and they'll give them a benzo and even people in recovery, you know, long-term recovery, they're, they'll be dealing with one of those issues you mentioned, and they'll go to a, their physician who they trust, and they say, yeah, just take, you know, take some Xanax or low-dose Klonopin, and that's how you can kind of, we, we, uh, we have the uh, table set before us, but I think your topic, Louise, was very appropriate for uh, this day and age, and so many boomers kind of hitting retirement and all. 
uh, more than ever, my private practice, I've had more seniors just kind of uh, come into it and, and maybe they drank pretty successfully most of their life. But when they hit retirement, man, they are just they were just hitting it heavy. So so thanks so much. Thank you. And where, what part of the world are you from? I'm from part of the world called Philadelphia, right outside Philadelphia. Oh. So I grew up in Pittsburgh. So I hear that there's there's a twang, by the oh, way, that you can hear in, in, in from old times. But you know, I I think what so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, and I I think that we have an ethical obligation as um, individual practitioners and as groups um, to do that, and also you know to lobby in um, Washington as well um, for this particular population and um, to join um, different groups to make a difference because it will be, you know, 2030 is not that far away. Um, and when I think about the number of people that will be over the age of 65 versus the number of well, the people that are five are gonna be, you know, they're gonna be the teenagers now. Um, there is a, a real need for services and services that really, um, you know, start where the client is, but also um, value integrity. So even if you had time for groups or narrative, you know, everybody has, I'm, obviously I do a research methodology called portraiture when I'm inviting people to change in interventions, but you know, everybody has a story and being able to record oral history or even having a family, like, let's tell a story because we know in this digital age, everything's stored, like the photos are all stored now digitally, but being able to tell a story. So even if you had an assignment for like the seniors you work with, why don't you record, because everybody has a little phone, your story so you're family or others of the same ilk um, could could learn from you. So, you know, for, you know, the gentleman who's working just with a gay population, have them record their story, do a, do a writing, um, record their story so that there can be this history, oral history. Um, many museums do that as well. Are there any other questions, concerns? There's such a wonderful audience. Very kind. I see your smiles. Some of you, I can see your beautiful smiles, beautiful faces. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I, I really wanna tell you how much I appreciate being with you. Um, how much, if you want to get a hold of me, I don't know if I even have a slide for that, but, um, you make all the difference. Um, no, I don't. If you want to get a hold of me, I do um, have a pretty robust website. It's called allaboutinterventions.com. I do um, blog all the time um, on a variety of different topics. You can sign up. And I have written about three books, but I still, I still do um, several different things. I teach all over the, the world. I do complicated uh, mental health, substance abuse, chronic pain, invitations to change, which I call um, interventions um, all over the world. And I do solution-focused family coaching. So um, it's an honor to be with you today um, and feel free to reach out in any way you want to me. Oh, my phone number is 619-507-1699.